Hello, my name is Tara Wick, and I am a community partner with the Colorado Trust, and I would like to welcome you to the webinar Lessons and Community Leadership through Colorado Blueprint 2.0 with Danielle Lendre from the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade. This webinar is the fourth in a six-part rural development learning, learning series, which is running from January 8th to 18th. The series is sponsored by resident teams of the communities of Antonito, Avondale, Dove Creek, Olathe, San Luis, and Sawatch in partnership with the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center and the Colorado Trust. Each of these communities has an organized team of residents who have committed thousands of volunteer hours over the last two years to identifying and analyzing their community's most pressing issues and are developing community health equity plans to address these issues at the roots. Each resident team has identified depressed economic conditions in their small rural communities as a root cause issue, one that is especially affecting children and non-college bound young people. Communities have recognized that depressed economic conditions are intrinsically bound with social disconnection and systems of discrimination that often play out along race and class lines. Residents know that building their power, especially the power of those most affected by the issues, to advocate for themselves and their community's future will be an important part of any solution. These webinars were designed to connect resident teams to statewide experts working on solutions to Colorado's rural economic development challenges and to inspire thinking and conversation at the local and regional level. Recordings of these webinars will be made available on the Colorado Trust website for later viewing. A number of resident teams plan to invite community residents, local elected officials, and other partners to view and, to view and discuss these webinars together. The webinars will be interpreted and the material will be translated into Spanish in the coming weeks. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Danielle Lendre. Danielle oversees Blueprint 2.0 for the office, Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, empowering rural communities to identify catalysts for positive economic change through technical assistance. She has a BA in economics from the University of Colorado Boulder with an environmental and natural resource emphasis. And now without further delay, let's begin the presentation. Danielle, thank you and welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tara. And uh, thank you so much to everybody else um, who's uh, part of this webinar today. Um, I'm going to introduce my um, program or the program I say sh that I oversee, which is called Blueprint 2.0. Um, but before I do so, I'm going to give everyone a little bit of background in terms of the organization that I work for and the division specifically that I work for. So we'll start kind of at a 30,000 foot view of OEDIT itself, um, because there are a lot of resources that are located within our office that can also help economic development in rural communities. Um, and then also in terms of our division. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, this is my contact information. There will be another slide at the end of this presentation um, with all of the same information on it. But again, my name is Danielle Andre. I'm the regional coordinator and analyst for the uh, State Office of Economic Development, which means that I oversee Blueprint 2.0 and I support the Regional Economic Development Division within our office. So first, I think most importantly is who is the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade? Um, so we are a government, we're a state government agency. Uh, we are under the umbrella of the governor's office. Um, and our ultimate goal is to create a business friendly environment in the state of Colorado. And this takes on a lot of different forms. Uh, we collaborate with statewide partners. We have technical assistance and financial um, resources. We support regional economic development activities around the state. And like I said, our, our main goal is just creating that positive business climate um, through the support of dynamic um, industries and those interactions throughout Colorado. We have upwards, I believe, nine unique divisions as um, it, within our office right now. Uh, we house the Colorado Tourism Office, um, the 
Colorado um, Office of the Outdoor Recreation Industry. Um, we house Global Business Development, whose mission is to attract business from all around, not just the country, but the world, to the state of Colorado. We house the state um, small business development centers, as well as the minority business office, um, as well as Colorado Creative Industries and film. So a lot of different divisions impacting the state economy in a lot of different ways. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot view. Um, and in a nutshell, the way that I like to, the way that I like to introduce our office and the way that I like people to kind of think about our office is we are the sales office for the state of Colorado. Both within Colorado and externally, we are the office that really demonstrates why this is the best place in the country to work and the best place in the country to live. So my division specifically, regional economic development, um, we have this kind of broad um, mandate or mission, if you will, and that's to advance um, local economic development plans and initiatives through education, technical assistance, and access to resources. And what that means is more than anything else, we listen. We are the division that comes to your communities and listens to what you have to say and what you need. Um, really, we kind of check the economic pulse of the state regionally because and I believe that all of you out there know this, what's happening in Denver is not representative of the whole of the state. So we make sure to bring in the regional viewpoints, the regional challenges, opportunities around the state, and we communicate those throughout our office and throughout the governor's office to make sure that the programs, the initiatives, the different financing options that we have available within our office and more broadly at the government state government level are really responsive to actually what you need. So that gets us into the Colorado blueprint. Um, and this is a little bit of background. Um, some of you might be familiar with this process when it happened, but the Colorado blueprint was a statewide bottom up approach for an economic devel development planning initiative. And the idea was to develop a comprehensive um, economic development strategy for the entire state. It took place in 2011 during Governor Hickenlooper's first term. And the idea was to go out and speak with every single corner of the state. So over all of those listening sessions, more than 5,000 people were engaged in all 64 counties. And the idea was to come up with a summary expressing kind of the needs, the priorities, strengths, and visioning for each of the 14 Colorado planning regions. And then they were kind of rolled into these 14 regional statements and there were these themes that we found throughout them and and the themes that we really wanted to focus this comprehensive strategy on were building a business friendly environment um, retaining growing and recruiting companies increasing access to capital over the state creating and marketing a stronger colorado brand educating and training workforce and cultivating innovation and technology and essentially what it did is it gave Colorado a framework to build not only this comprehensive strategy, but a plan that aligned our existing efforts and identified opportunities for future growth and focused investments. And it really provided each region with a set of achievable objectives. As I said, I mean, this was, this was driven by each region in the state not only telling us what they wanted in terms of their future plans, but how they could essentially get there. As you all know, however, the economic recovery that has been so strong in the front range has not been felt everywhere else throughout the state of Colorado. And one of the shortcomings of the Colorado blueprint, despite its 
kind of grand long-term vision is that there are some regions in the state, namely the Front Range, that can really activate resources a lot easier than can be done in some rural areas, and therefore they can realize those goals on definitely an accelerated path. So our office got back together and came up with Blueprint 2.0. And what Blueprint 2.0, the way that we like to call it, is we developed tactical initiatives in response. So instead of just developing a framework, not that a framework or comprehensive planning, um, action planning, not that that is in any way uh, a bad thing. In fact, it's very important to the success of your communities. Um, but, but the idea with developing kind of these tactical initiatives instead is that this broad comprehensive framework doesn't necessarily concern itself with very specific regional and community-wide needs. And so in the same way that we developed the original blueprint, we went around again to all 14 um, of the state's regions, met with many different community and, and regional leaders, um, and we got feedback through focus groups. And what we wanted to do was turn that feedback into a statewide set of initiatives that we could use to advance economies around the state. And so the goal of the entire program is to leverage all of these different partnerships and resources that we have um, at the state level to really further the economic development goals of rural Colorado. Um, the initiatives are designed to allow autonomy. They are designed to allow flexibility because um, ultimately we realize that we cannot come in and tell any one community what to do because communities really know what is best for themselves. And I'm sure that you would all agree to this. And so we developed the initiatives essentially around this idea that we can come up with these specialized resources and tools for education, but that the community is going to be the ultimate arbiter of how those tools are essentially deployed. So essentially, what is it? And it is a series of technical assistance initiatives designed around specific economic development concentrations. Like I said, they were uh, developed through these strategy sessions um, after conducting focus groups. Um, and we analyzed kind of the most frequent challenges or requests for assistance. And then we worked both within our office to identify the best kind of internal champions. Like I said, we have all of those divisions that have all of their, you know, specific concentrations of where they can be really good resources. And then we looked outside our office to who in either the private or the public sector could be the best resource for us to partner with in order to make these initiatives the best use of time for all of your different communities. So it's an annual competitive program um, with a finalized listing of initiatives that we'll make available um, in, I'd say, mid-February. Applications are available throughout the spring, and don't worry if you're writing this down, I have an entire slide that's just about the application, um, so this is still in the overview. Recipient selection in midsummer, deployment um, throughout summer and fall, and then um, actually deployment can be all the way through the next application cycle, as each initiative kind of varies in length. And Essentially, so what can Blueprint 2.0 do for your community? So it helps communities identify these really focused strategies for economic development. And I would say more so than just economic development, but economic diversification is, is really one of the goals. So, you know, a targeted, um, and I'll go into kind of what all of the different initiatives look like, but, you know, a targeted initiative around tourism is going to be a lot different then, like I said, a you know, comprehensive planning strategy, a targeted initiative around marketing is going to have a lot um, different of an outcome than would one around just business retention and attraction. So 
it really helps communities identify these focus strategies and then connects them with resources that we have access to here at the state. And that's both technical assistance um, and non-monetary resources and financial resor resources. It assists with um, community engagement and prioritization of different goals. And then the way that we really like to think about Blueprint 2.0 is it serves as a catalyst for economic development activities. And what we really mean by that is that Blueprint 2.0 is, is foundational work, is really base, base community level foundational work that allows our other resources that we have within our office to build off of. So, Talking about um, our pilot year of Blueprint 2.0. Um, so this took place in 2016 through 2017. And the reason why I'm focusing on this is because we're actually still engaged in um, our 2017, 2018 round of Blueprint 2.0. And although I do have some feedback from that, um, already it is too premature to really cite any specific outcomes um, as none of the initiatives are actually even complete at this point. So looking back on Blueprint 2.0 from um, 2016, we had 27 initiatives of 10 of these specific um, economic development concentrations that I spoke of in 10 of Colorado's 14 regions. Some communities uh, received more than one initiative, um, and we still allow that. There are definitely some initiatives that actually do a very good job of building off of each other. So we were in almost every single corner of the state. I believe it was something like 18 different communities or regions. And when I say regions, I mean um, either at a county level or actually at a regional level um, were involved in the pilot year of Blueprint 2.0. And the reasons why, or the reason why this, um, this webinar is entitled lessons in community leadership is because I think that our office learned just as much about what works in rural Colorado and the way that we can really make a difference as communities learned about, you know, their own capability for community leadership in driving um, one of these initiatives forward. So the initiatives that we had the first year were we had a tourism initiative, a branding initiative, outdoor recreation, um, an incubator and accelerator. Um, our um, Colorado Creative Industries had an initiative. We had something called adaptive reuse, which was how to take a vacant building in your area and market it for um, development. Uh, we had business attraction. Um, we had competitive advantage, which came out to your community and did a small scale SWOT, SWOT analysis, excuse me. Um, we had a tiny homes initiative and then a community led initiative. And so we, again, like I said, I'll go through what we're offering this year. Um, one of the major things that our office learned um, is that just by going around and doing listening tours, maybe we're not getting all of the right information in terms of the development of initiatives. We definitely had to um, update or change some of the initiatives altogether between 27, or I should say the 2016, 2017 round, and then the 2017, 2018 round. Um, and that's just because we don't actually have some of the resources uh, that communities would wish that we actually did have. And that was kind of, a, that was kind of a learning lesson for us. And then also there is a degree of managing expectations, which is something that we had to do um, with ourselves. And then something that we kind of um, had to reconcile with in communities. But we did a number of, we, we sent a survey out and then we also, um, did a kind of large scale 
um, report from the first year of Blueprint 2.0. And we found some of these key benefits um, that existed throughout initiatives that were both successful and did not have the level of success that we had desired. And, you know, community momentum came out of that. And what we mean by that is that communities told us that they felt that they were more able to really get something off of the ground and, and going in kind of a concentration that they had not been able to focus on before. So it really gave communities that. Um, stakeholder engagement, and I'll touch on this multiple times throughout the course of this webinar, um, stakeholder engagement is absolutely critical, as I'm sure you all know, to the success of any community-led sort of initiative. Um, and so stakeholder engagement being as big of a part as it was really tied into the success of the various initiatives because when community leaders for these specific initiatives were able to get their communities really excited about the possibilities for an initiative, we saw the chances of success, the, excuse me, of success for that initiative go way up. The quality of information was something that communities responded to us with very positively. Um, and this is definitely one of those areas where we do have a distinct advantage, either from us or our outside partners who we work with. Um, we were really able to provide the selected communities with some of the best, most up-to-date information on whichever of the concentrations they were interested in. Um, as well as exposure, exposure to resources. This is uh, a really big one because when we go out as a part of, you know, just regional economic development, we're really having um, a lot of times these more one-off conversations about a very specific issue and then getting our different regional partners in connection with a very specific resource. We don't, as frequently as we would like, have the opportunity to go to areas about a very specific issue and then provide communities with a listing of many different resources that through either direct or creative means could be used to address whatever issue um, that is that the community is then focusing on. And then we also heard about um, credibility and legitimacy. Um, a lot of communities said that by bringing in an outside third party and not necessarily the state, um, some of the initiatives have mentorships, for example, but by bringing in that you know, outside resource that they were able to really galvanize their community in a way that they hadn't to before. And they really attributed that to having that third party resource coming in as, you know, an outside arbiter of whatever problem, challenge, or even opportunity that a community was facing. Um, I do need to say here that, um, Blueprint 2.0 is technical assistance only. And what I mean by that is it is an unfunded series of initiatives. Um, basically time is our biggest resource when it comes to these initiatives. And that's why they last from anywhere between, you know, three to eight months is we realize that while we may not have actual financial resources, to give as a part specifically of Blueprint 2.0, that by spending time and a lot of high quality information dense time with our communities that we can really make a substantial impact. So if you'll think about it in that way, Blueprint 2.0 is really like having one-on-one -on -one time with a consultant around these various um, different concentrations. So, like I said, the majority of the Blueprint 2.0 work in the first year was really setting the stage for more concrete work in the future. So it was planning, strategizing, lots of learning, and a lot of relationship building. Um, but we do have some really fantastic specific successes 
that we are really proud of that came out of that first year. Um, the community of Dillon used the industry information provided in two of the different initiatives that they were awarded, so the Adapted for Use and the Competitive Advantage, um, to secure an $800,000 grant for the renovation of a community amphitheater. Um, five communities developed long-term task forces or working groups, which again, that's a big part of that community engagement long-term um, to make sure that kind of the, the motivation and the momentum that starts as a part of a Blueprint 2.0 project actually continues going long after the initiative is over. Um, Communities cited upwards of 22 new partnerships and 40 um, individual partnerships strengthened. What I mean by that is partnerships between communities and state agencies, partnerships between communities and regional organizations, federal organizations, different private sector partnerships, and different um, partnerships with other kind of nonprofit resources. Um, in Delta County, we saw increased lodging tax revenue and social media activity um, as a part of efforts that were um, given to the community in a comprehensive uh, tourism destination marketing strategy. Um, and then eight large scale plans or reports completed um, to inform and activate local efforts. So we have, so like I said, um, we're in the middle of the 2017 round right now. And the way that we developed that round, um, like I said, is we took a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback from this first round to make sure that we were having the type of impact that we wanted to see. As I said, some of the initiatives were successful, some of the initiatives were not. But what the communities really gave our office um, the opportunity to do was to understand what had worked, what didn't work, and maybe where in those original focus groups, we had misunderstood the purpose of the community indicating that something was a challenge or something that they would like to have the opportunity to have access to. And so we created a new round um, of initiatives, only three from the original 2016 round of initiatives came back for the second year and that were or excuse me those were the marketing the outdoor recreation and the tourism promotion and development initiative and a lot of the initiatives actually just got updates and replacements to put them into kind of a more useful framework and make sure that they were outcome driven for the benefits of the community so just a couple options or just a couple examples of what's already happened is, you know, in Rio Blanco County, um, they were awarded uh, the Tourism Promotion and Development Initiative, and they worked with their consultant on our Colorado Tourism Office Marketing Matching Grant, and they were awarded that. One of our newest initiatives is called the Certified Small Business Community. For the record, this does actually have some funding associated with it. And essentially what the initiative is for is to bolster small business activity by um, an in by excuse me, by inviting an increase of small business development center activities. And so in Lincoln County alone, they've seen a 300% increase in impact hours for small business consulting. Our new creative industries initiative um, has already seen the, um, has seen a community organization apply for a 501c3 status and get a resolution through their town board um, towards the creation of a new creative industry. Multiple communities that we had our co-working 101 initiative in, which replaced our incubator and accelerator initiative, have already started working with private business owners um, and private property owners to look at potential locations for co-working spaces in their community. 
Moffat County has already identified a community brand and is moving forward with a logo after their marketing initiative. And the town of Hayden has begun working on every project that we identified through a community placemaking initiative. And they are going to have expected completion dates beginning as early as summer of 2018. So we've already seen a lot of really phenomenal work from 2017, and we really look forward to sharing that um, towards the end of July when we issue our second annual report for Blueprint 2.0. Um, we're planning another li listening session this year, albeit uh, much smaller in scale. Uh, we realize that you have a lot going on as communities and we do not want to take any more of your time that we need to to determine what we should be doing in order to support you in every capacity that we can. This program is meant to be flexible and adapt. So like I said, moving forward, I believe that there are some challenges that still face rural Colorado that chain, that rural Colorado faced three years ago, but a lot of things have changed. And so we want to understand where we can continue to activate resources around the state in the best service of the economic development goals of rural Colorado. So with all that being said, um, how to apply? And this is where I get specific. So in February, um, we are, or I should say the middle of February, we're going to finalize our round of initiatives for this year. I will be providing, um, if anyone would like, our marketing material from last year, but also I will make sure that all of our new marketing material, including descriptions of the initiatives for this year, um, make it out to all of your communities um, so that you know exactly what we are planning on offering to the state. We will open applications up um, from March 15th to June 1st. Um, and as always, if you are planning on applying for any of these initiatives and you have any questions about the application, please contact me. I'd be more than happy to work with each and every one of you on whatever initiative it is that you know really speaks to the goals that you have for your community. All of the applications will be available on our website, which is choosecolorado.com. Um, to make it very easy, we'll put a banner on our homepage um, that will take you right to the right to our portal where you'll apply. And then what you'll need to demonstrate is strong community leadership, broad community support, previous successful implementation of projects, and then alignment with goals and strategies. And what I mean is alignment with your current goals and strategies or your identified goals and strategies as a community. And the reason why that is so important to us is because if communities have previously identified goals, that usually means that there is a little bit more buy-in and community support than as if this is something that is completely new. So that kind of segues me into one of the most important parts, I would say actually the most important part of you know, this entire webinar, which is what makes a successful initiative. And I'm, I'm gonna go into this with, these are not just the items that, or, or attributes or characteristics that will make a successful Blueprint 2.0 initiative. I think that in going through this process and in working with all of our divisions who themselves have so many projects throughout all of Colorado. These are the characteristics that we've identified that just generally make a community project successful. And so we're not just interested in the success of a Blueprint 2.0 initiative for what it does for Blueprint 2.0. We're interested in what makes a successful initiative because of how it will impact not just your individual community, but the idea that there is a ripple effect. Whereas if any of our initiatives are successful in your community, we hope that there will be a ripple effect regionally. And especially if a community is demonstrating all of these different attributes, I think that they stand to be really 
an inspiration for other communities that are kind of having a harder time getting motivated and, and getting galvanized and getting their community to buy in to different strategies that they have. So the first thing that makes an initiative successful for us, and again, all of these are asked about um, on our application, and so they do need to be demonstrated, is a champion. And it's not just community leadership that we're looking for, but we're looking for someone who's actually going to drive an initiative forward. And essentially somebody who can even drive an initiative forward through a little bit of opposition. And the reason why I say a little bit of opposition is because we've definitely gotten applications in the past where there's been a very motivated individual who certainly it feels like could get a lot of work done. But this is where we get into that absolutely second critical component of community buy-in. So not only does the champion need to be someone with a lot of drive, but they need to be someone who can engage the community and somebody who's dedicated and will follow through, but the community also has to be bought into them. So by just having a leader, an initiative isn't necessarily going to be successful. There has to be a lot of community support. So we require multiple letters of support. Like I said, just because you have a champion does not mean that there is necessarily uh, the room for an initiative. There definitely has to be capacity. Just because there's one person driving the initiative forward doesn't mean that it doesn't require not just a lot of community support, but a lot of community work. So, and, and I mean, initiatives will fail, projects will fail, really without this community buy-in. And as Tara has told me, you all have been working tirelessly to really, you know, bolster your, your communities and, you know, how empowered they feel. And I feel like that would make you all really excellent candidates for being able to actually implement one of the Blueprint 2.0 initiatives or any of the programs that we have in our office for that matter, because you already have that grassroots support built that would be required to see something through to fruition. So, I mean, we have a certain, we have some certain recommendations for how you get community buy-in. I'm sure that you've all heard these before, um, and I'm sure that you're currently engaged in them but our recommendations are really generate enthusiasm. Um, when I said that we are the sales office for the state of Colorado, we kind of like to see that in every facet of the work that we do. And what I mean by that is sell your community and sell your ideas. We, we really are interested in, in communities that are, that are really enthusiastic about what could be. So find ways to communicate with your community. This is definitely one of the hardest ones that we've seen in terms of um, community leadership. Uh, quite frequently, um, community leaders, especially in rural communities, wear so many hats that it's very difficult to kind of always be a cheerleader, if you will. But truthfully, that is what's necessary. I think that in smaller communities where you don't necessarily have these kind of really big flashy wins all the time, it's really worth looking at what is being done in your community that is a win and is really important. So find a way to speak about things like wastewater treatment through an extremely positive lens and by how that will positively impact your community and why it's a win for your community. You know, find ways to communicate the why. Why is it good? Why is it important? Why your community members should care? And that generates enthusiasm. And unfortunately, that kind of level of communication is something that it really needs to be maintained at a consistent level so that your community members know, you know, this is what's being done 
to specifically impact my life positively by my local community leadership or municipality or you know whatever local organization it is. Number three is time. These projects take time and that is not just the amount of time that the initiative is actually running for. I say that even our initiatives that only take you know three months of kind of intensive consulting, if you will, to complete means that on the end of the community, that's looking like probably at least another year of work before those goals are realized. They're designed to really be building blocks. They are designed to be foundational. And so when you think of an initiative that is just foundational work, at the end, we will leave a community with an action plan to really build upon that foundation. And that is kind of a measure of whether or not an initiative is successful is whether or not that foundation gets built on. Because just by having the foundation, obviously, like I've said before, you know, the, mo the momentum is so critical to keep going that by just having the foundation alone, not that much will actually be achieved. So like I said, these are designed to be catalytic, which means that they're really going to take a considerable amount of time on the part of the community to get going and, and, and to see something that's really tangible. And that's where it, the impetus is definitely on the community to drive it forward. And again, this is why we just stress the issue of having a solid champion and having solid community buy-in because really it is going to take that time and be prepared for it. And I would say that especially relationship building is probably one of the more time intensive aspects of any of these initiatives altogether. Flexibility is a really big one be very malleable as a community, I would say. Um, we've found that in going through a lot of these initiatives, we have really gotten rid of, I think with the exception of wanting to be outcome driven, we understand that there are a lot of different ways to get to an outcome. Um, and so I think as a community, it's very important to, to understand that um, as well. So many of our initiatives Say so actually, all, all of our initiatives really derive their strength from gathering community feedback. Community feedback isn't always going to be positive. And I think that all of us have dealt with individuals and communities who are so resistant to change that they're kind of willing to put a halt to, to anything that would indicate forward progress. Be prepared to deal with those individuals. And like I said, if you can really make your case for why, if you can make your case for why is this going to positively impact someone's life, it's a lot easier to work with the individuals who are really change averse. But you have to be prepared to, you know, really act on different varieties of feedback from, you know, different sources, even if they differ from your original uh, initiative goals, because really that's, that's what's going to, you know, give you the potential. That's what's going to make an initiative strong. That's what's going to make any sort of, you know, community planning or community project strong is, is by really allowing as much community feedback as possible and then allowing the changes that may or may not come with that. And the last one um, I really have to say is positivity. And this is, is positivity permeating every degree of your applications. And I think this is how we really got on the subject of us doing a webinar for Blueprint 2.0 in the first place is we really started talking about how communities can start to refer to themselves after, you know, a long period of 
perhaps economic hardship. And we understand that. We, we understand that not everywhere in the state recovered. We understand that there are some particular places in the state where it may not feel like recovery is is actually going to happen. And so there can be a degree of, of negativity that ends up being pervasive. We, we understand where that's coming from, but that isn't going to change what is or what has happened. So if I can say, you know, anything in terms of not just applying for Blueprint 2.0, but really focusing on where your communities can go into the future is don't focus on the negative, don't focus on the bad, don't focus on the past. We're aware, that's why we created this program, that's why we have as many programs as we do that are focused on rural places that have, you know, had major primary employers leave. Focus on the future, focus on your opportunities, focus what is unique about you know your community and really change the way that you speak about your community and it'll change the way that others perceive you and so really in in our applications we want to see positivity just really be pervasive because really when when you start to shift the way that you talk about your communities, you really will see a change in the way that you feel about your communities. And then in the way that other people that you're speaking to feel about, you know, your community. So, like I said, there is a place specifically in the application where you, you can talk about um, your level of distress um, and any other major economic shocks that, you know, your community has undergone, but in everything else, it should really be focused on where your community can go and not as much the challenges that are hindering you from getting there. Because we all know that they exist. It's more about what these initiatives can do to really help you overcome. So coming kind of full circle back to, you know, the very beginning of this, when I was talking about OEDIT being the kind of the sales office, if you will, for the state of Colorado, be the sales people for your community. That is kind of the biggest piece of advice that I can really give because it, it, it really will change the way that you feel about your community's potential and it'll open up different opportunities for you to realize that potential. So thank you all very, very much for having me. That is all I have for my presentation. Again, this is my contact information. Please contact me for um, anything, honestly, that relates to my office, whether it be Blueprint 2.0 or not. But definitely, if you are considering applying um, and you need help with any specific um, any specifics on the application or, you know, understanding kind of different facets of the different initiatives, I would be more than happy um, to speak with you about, you know, any of those subjects. So I'd be thrilled to take any of your questions if you have any. I know that that was kind of uh, information dense and I know that you've had a lot of webinars in the, the last few days. But yeah, please, if you have any questions. One of the things that I think people might really benefit from just a quick overview of, um, and I don't know maybe if it could even make sense to share your screen and look at the website, but is um, maybe just some very concrete examples of the different initiatives that the Colorado Blueprint 2.0 has professional, uh, has technical assistance around. Mm -hmm. um, as I look at the website and I see tourism, tourism promotion and development, community placemaking, co-working, tiny homes workshop, there's a lot of different um, initiatives. And I think um, and those are just for everybody's knowledge available on their website and there's a lot of great information there, but would you be willing to just give kind of an overview of those? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and maybe just like yes, for anybody who's who's not more familiar, like just you know, if they were to apply to Colorado Blueprint 2.0 um, through one of these initiatives, you know, what could they? What would that mean for them as a as a community? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, to give you an overview, and I know that some of you are on the phone. Um, so again, please go to our website, choosecolorado.com. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, it will say Colorado Blueprint, and that is the page that you would want to click on. This is our homepage. And if, uh, when all, the applications are available, um, if you see right now how there's a red banner on the top that says applications now available, for advanced industries, early stage capital, we're going to do the exact same thing for Blueprint 2.0. So scrolling all the way down, you can go to Colorado Blueprint. And this is where we will list our Blueprint 2.0 initiatives. And also on here, you can click on any one of um, the initiatives themselves. And they'll have last year's marketing materials, if you see that. So to go into uh, detail, for um, example, on tourism. But just for those of you who aren't seeing my screen share. Um, and I think everybody actually probably is. I don't think oh. we have any people just on the phone today. Okay, so if, okay. if you wanted, would you mind just kind of like briefly going over the ones um, down below there that you have the icons for? Like just, just so folks understand that each one of those icons represents an area where you can apply for technical assistance for your community. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Each of these where it has the, the learn more essentially is going to take you to, and I say marketing material, it's, these are our one page overviews of each of the initiatives. So they go into detail on what the initiative is about and what the initiative is going to offer to your community. They're pretty specific on potential outcomes, what you can expect, what the particular focus is on. So right now that was the certified small business community. We have brand building, which is going to be our you know, comprehensive branding initiative that will conduct community interviews, um, and then go through um, a series of webinars on community marketing. Um, there's uh, our film and major production initiative, which, like I said, um, please go through these, but do understand that they will be changing in between now and, and February. But absolutely, to get an idea of what our different offerings are going to be, uh, yeah, I would, I would highly recommend going through this. And I can tell you from um, where we're at right now and the discussions we're having of what we're continuing, um, even though some of the initiatives might uh, undergo kind of small tweaks, we are absolutely continuing with tourism promotion and development, co-working 101, the certified small business community, brand building for communities, Film and Major Production Initiative, Creativity Lab of Colorado, and Grow Your Outdoor Recreation Industry. So those are all areas that if a community was interested in pursuing some technical support, having somebody come and really walk them through the process of understanding what it would mean for their community to do that, and all the things you list in the more detailed, they, that's where they would want to apply would be through that initiative. Absolutely, right? yeah. Okay. And so... What it is, is if, if you are going to apply, um, essentially it'll have a, it would have an apply now up here where it says learn more. Um, and then it'll also have probably a big button right about here that will say apply now. Um, obviously you do apply for each initiative um, individually, but it's all done through, we have an online portal essentially, and all of the initiatives will be, all of the initiative uh, applications will be listed under that portal. Okay. But, um, Lynette Rowland has a question coming in. She said, can you please give an example of a community that used the assistance with co-working space and what your office helped with in the name of the community, if possible? Absolutely. Um, so I have a personal stake in the co-working 101 initiative. I was actually the internal initiative lead 
So it is something that I am very, very proud of. Um, we had three communities apply. Unfortunately, only two communities were able to go through with the technical assistance. And that is Rio Blanco County. So if you're familiar with the communities of Meeker and Rangeley, um, and then uh, the town of Sterling in Logan County. So those were essentially the, the, the two applicants. And what we did is we did, uh, we partnered with um, a company called Proximity Space. Proximity Space is a um, private co-working startup based out of Montrose. I believe at this point in time, I want to say they have at least 10 co-working spaces throughout the state of Colorado. But they, they, have, they, they, were, they were one of our last um, webinars. Oh, perfect. Yeah. There mm -hmm. you are. We love proximity space. So yeah, they partnered with us on, on Coworking 101. And essentially what it was is we kind of did scoping calls for the communities to try and figure out where they were at and give them unique resources um, or give them kind of ideas for unique resources that, that they could pursue. And then the biggest part of, of the initiative is we did um, the Coworking 101 workshop and the Coworking 101 workshop was we invited um, both of the communities here to Denver and we toured um, six different co-working spaces here in the Denver metro area. And the reason why we did that, I understand from communities uh, in rural Colorado that, you know, coming to Denver is, is not the same as, you know, what, sorry, I'm trying to adjust this so that the light doesn't um, glare everyone out. But at the end of the day, given the fact that there are not necessarily a substantial concentration of co-working spaces in rural communities, um, we wanted to kind of give each of the communities an idea of what was possible and the idea that co-working spaces are something that are scalable. So we started out with Proximity Space giving um, a presentation of their co-working space how they got um, you know, public funding involved, how they got their private funding involved, how they got out off the ground. They talked about their experiences in Ridgeway and in Grand Junction as well, because their stories are really unique, but they could really apply to kind of anywhere, depending on, especially if you take them a little piecemeal. So from there, we went to um, our first co-working space, um, was in a Sears Roebuck house to give you an idea of the different spaces that we went to. And so we just toured spaces that started in size from having only about 40 members up to a co-working, you can't even really call it a co-working space. It's called Industry Denver. And essentially what it is, is it's shared office space. And I want to say that it's about 150,000 square feet. So really to just give an idea of what the scale of, of co-working and shared office space can take on and the idea that it's not a one size fits all and you do what's right for your community. So some of the communities actually had a little bit of funding set aside because they already had um, co-working in mind as something that they would like to do a public private partnership with. One of the other issues that the communities faced however, was the idea of really um, addressing uh, startup density and entrepreneurial density and finding kind of the right people to be engaged with the co-working space. So we've gotten the communities involved with another organization that's called Startup Colorado. What Startup Colorado does is they come in and they do um, workshops around, well, how do your municipal or your you know, public community leaders connect with your private entrepreneurial leaders? And how do you then really work together to build that density? So eventually between the two kind of partnerships, so with Coworking 101 and, and now the knowledge that the communities have going forward in terms of you know, the different models and different funding structures, um, different costs that can be associated with um, co-working spaces. And then once they've really identified kind of what their talent density is, 
then the communities will have a better idea of, okay, well, who, who are we going to partner with on this co-working space? You know, is it going to be public? Is it going to be public private? Is it going to be fully private? Um, we toured spaces that, you know, have all of those different funding structures. And then also, you know, who's, so not just who's going to run it, but who are going to be the tenants. So it is definitely one of those longer term kind of multi-stage initiatives with the ultimate outcome of we would like to see a co-working space in almost every single rural community in Colorado. So I hope that answered your question. I maybe went in the weeds a little bit, but I'm pretty fond of it. So <laughs> I have a personal bias there. So looking at the different initiatives um, and this one of the things that we heard from one of our other speakers was the importance of promoting entrepreneurship in, in small communities. And we're especially, I think, in these communities thinking about who in the community is um, kind of most impacted by the depressed economic conditions, um, those young people who may not be college bound, who may be um, more looking towards um, possibly being able to be entrepreneurs themselves. Um, how of the different initiatives that, that you all um, um, support and promote and partner with, what are the ones that you think are the best suited for promoting entrepreneurship? So I think I can talk about specific initiatives that would lend themselves more to entrepreneurship. But with that being said, I think that kind of falls into the realm of, well, what do you want the initiative to do for your community? That really comes from a place more of, you know, an individual community identifying which initiative would work for them and then what are kind of the goals or avenues that they want to pursue through that specific initiative, really. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, just on, on a cursory glance, Co-working is very focused on entrepreneurship, creativity lab, and really, you know, supporting creative industries in your community. That is another one that is really focused on entrepreneurship, um, outdoor recreation and tourism, very focused on entrepreneurship, but really any of it, well, and obviously the uh, certified small business community, which I just realized is actually not on here. Um, I'm mm. going to have to fix that. Mm. The, the one pager for the certified small business community is right here, but okay. unfortunately our, our press release did not um, talk to them because yeah, that, that right there is increasing the amount of small business development center resources that are in your community. So that okay. is absolutely entrepreneurship. But Danielle, let me inter interrupt you. I'm sorry. There was another question that came in um, from, also from Lynette saying, please describe what you mean by community placemaking. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, j just to finish that, though, um, my, my kind of train of thought there was, again, these are really supposed to be community driven. So if you want to make it about entrepreneurship, make it about entrepreneurship, and mm -hmm. we'll find a way to make it work. So community placemaking. So this is one of our more esoteric ones, but we still think that it is very important. So community placemaking is really this idea of developing a strong sense of place um, and a strong sense of, you know, comfort and, and community in places. And so that may sound extremely abstract and, and it, it has kind of senses of that. But think about, for example, the last time that you were in a place that just had small or large that just had this amazing downtown that was really vibrant and had a lot of activity and people were walking and there were a lot of businesses and you didn't see, you know, a, a lot of vacancy and it, it just felt really alive and it felt like a place where people wanted to be. That is the idea of community placemaking. So it really is developing that sense of place. So what we do is we partner with an organization called Community Builders. They're out of Glenwood Springs. They are um, essentially city and urban planners at heart that want to bring the same idea of urban planning to, you know, 
this doesn't just need to work for cities. This can work for anywhere. So the idea is really focusing on, on downtown um, areas and then also kind of parks and other under excuse me, underutilized spaces within communities where, you know, you can really just with some flower boxes or through street banners or, you know, different uh, storefront displays, even in vacant buildings, really just increase kind of the the walkability and the desirability of a downtown area. And then the way that that in and of itself kind of spurs more economic activity. If it's a place where people want to be, then it's a place where people are going to go. And if it's a place where people are going to go, then it's a place where business also wants to be. So it really is kind of developing this, this positive feedback effect in communities by improving the just general desirability of their, their downtown areas. And that can be done through kind of what you know, placemakers, they call these quick wins, um, which are kind of these light, cheap, quick kind of things that you can do to just really um, improve the appearance. And then you can go all the way to, you know, hardscaping and, you know, reducing the amount of lanes and uh, on a downtown or expanding your sidewalks or things like that. But there, there are a lot of different examples of what you can do from small scale to large scale that really just invites people in. And so if, if um, a community were to choose to partner with Colorado Blueprint on a community placemaking and they were chosen um, to get that technical assistance, they would get to work directly with um, the consultants you mentioned to be able to develop like a community placemaking game plan for their, say, downtown area. Is that Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we were finished with um, our two community placemaking workshops in both Hayden and Kiowa, um, by the end of the, and this is by the end of the workshop, um, I'm also involved with um, those initiatives as well. Um, they haven't even received their um, kind of their final reports, which is like an implementation plan and strategy that's full of different of uh, excuse me, of just different resources and different recommendations that they can use. Um, by the time we were done with the workshop in and of itself, each community had an action plan with dates and funding resources and different um, basically project leaders to take on different aspects of kind of a grand placemaking envisioning strategy for their entire communities. Very cool. So yeah, it is very, it's very hands-on. It's very focused. We want to give communities through every single one of these, we want to give communities something that they can engage with immediately. And, and so that's why, you know, I, I had all of those notes down before we finished our, um, our planning process with community placemaking in Kiowa. But in, like I said, in Hayden, um, for example, which if any of you are familiar, it's this tiny little town in between um, Steamboat Springs and Craig um, up in Route County that they have a lot of really strong community drive. And I mean, they've already started working on some of the action items that we only gave them back in November. So you can get a lot of really good momentum going. And especially when you, we really like to use community workshops um, because, you know, people, will come out of the woodworks for things that you can get them interested in and you can identify commu new community leaders and you can get them involved on even some of these kind of like smaller scale projects to, I think, you know, for both parties to test the waters, but it's a really mm -hmm. great way to kind of break out of, we all know it's kind of called the, the, the same 10 people. And it's unfortunately what, usually happens, especially in smaller communities where you just don't have the population density to get as many people as you would like involved in some of these projects. But if you can really focus on these really amazing ideas, sometimes, you know, you can get new people to come out and be a part of, you know, these planning strategies and these workshops 
and you can get them engaged in new projects. And, you know, we've seen a lot of really tremendous work being done just through community leaders being able to delegate more of their responsibilities for some of these projects to just citizens who wanted to come out and make a difference. Awesome. These, these groups are very good at engaging people. They have nice. the teams of um, upwards of 20 folks who are meeting on a very regular basis. So Excellent. that's really great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep asking questions. Um, and then if I see questions come in on the Q&A board, I will definitely prioritize those. Um, one of the things I'm noticing is that in your list of um, initiatives and communities, there are some communities like Rio Blanco County that have two different initiatives going. So can a community um, choose to do that, apply for um, two different initiatives and get technical assistance in both areas? Absolutely. You can apply okay. for as many initiatives as you want. Okay. Um, what it comes down to is when we're in the selection Committee, um, I want to say that I think Rio Blanco County applied for four initiatives altogether. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, they're kind of labor intensive applications as well. So they just, they're very driven. They're, they're really, really driven. And they have a lot of great people who are, you know, working with them who can really kind of take on some of that capacity. But that is also something that we will gauge. You know, if a community were, to apply for say eight initiatives we would never award eight initiatives simply because the community would not be able to keep up with the workload mm -hmm. and we recognize that but again we don't limit it because you know sometimes some of the initiatives have shorter lifespans shall i say than some of the other initiatives nonetheless as i said kind of on that last slide Time is of the essence, I and mean, I understand that that is really one of the biggest challenges facing kind of any community is who has the time to do that much work above mm -hmm. and beyond what you're already doing from, you know, a community perspective. So that Absolutely. is something that we will judge, and thankfully we have not ever gotten into the place yet where we've had to really do um, a tie break. It just usually comes out through the selection process what initiatives are going to work best in a community. If we ever get to that point, uh, we might institute a new policy, but so far it's worked out both for us and for the communities. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, we have another question that's come from the participants. Um, can you tell us more about the branding by giving an example? We noticed that these are by counties. Does this have to be a county initiative for branding? No, not, no, not necessarily. It does not have to be. Um, that's just kind of the way that it's worked out. The counties have applied. Last year, San Luis Valley applied to do a branding. Mm -hmm. So let me think. Can, and yeah, some examples would be fantastic. Yeah, I was actually going to say, I might recommend looking at uh, Deltas. And the only reason why I say that is because um, I love the San Luis Valley very much, but uh, they decided after the initiative, they wanted to kind of go in their own direction. So I think that there's something also within our initiatives that is, you know, there's, there's the power of no, there's the power of understanding as a community that you might want to go in a different direction. And, you know, all that we really want to do is offer support and resources. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, if something doesn't work out, then, you know, that's, that's absolutely within not only the right, but it's the imperative of the community to realize, you know, if our partnership isn't working out and, and that there's something that, you know, needs to be done internally um, in order to make kind of your own initiatives work. So unfortunately, the, the San Luis Valley did not choose um, to go with our recommendations from, from last year. And, but they already, you know, they have a great kind of branding initiative that they're working on right now. Delta did. So if I wanted, so if you wanted an example, I would go to, and it is Delta County, but their economic development um, organization, I would go to their website. Okay. Um, and since I know we have some people on the phone from the San Luis Valley who may be interested if they aren't already connected mm -hmm. with the people who are um, kind of doing their own branding initiative, could 
you just suggest the organization they might reach to, or maybe we can follow up by email. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yep. Okay. I'm going to ask another one for the group. Right. Um, I noticed that the um, that the deadline for submitting an application to Colorado do Colorado do Colorado do Blueprint 2.0. Um, the very end was in June. I think they they opened in March. Is that correct? Yes, they will open okay. on March fifteenth, and they March fifteenth first. Okay, to June first. Um, what's the turnaround time after a community has submitted an application before they would be able to start implementing the um, initiative? So we will do selection at the end of June, and then we will do a um, we'll essentially do our announcement um, first or second week of July. And so we want all of our teams to be in contact with all of the selected communities kind of by that first week of August then. Okay. We like to get it going really quickly, essentially right after the announcement. I would say the exception with that is um, brand building for communities. And the only reason why I say, well, actually that and grow your outdoor recreation industry. Obviously, the teams will be in, in contact with the selected communities. The way that brand building for communities works is it's basically a intensive two-month boot camp. And so the um, company that does it for us, um, they're called DCI Development Counselors International, they only take on one community at a time to make sure that the community is getting all of that hands-on time and you know that they're engaged in every step of the way through you know what is your vision statement what is your community mission what is you know your logo going to look like our um, in-house design team will do logo work for the communities as well um, but it's just it's it's really intensive for that two months and so like i said they'll they'll stagger their projects mm -hmm. over the course of the year so essentially it would be probably one getting off of the ground in um, August or September, and then they might not do another one until January just because the holidays can really get in the way of everybody's ability to implement, understandably. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they usually do one in the fall and then two in the spring. The Grow Your Outdoor Recreation industry, the reason why that doesn't get off the ground until usually about late September is because that is um, done through MBA students at uh, University of Colorado Boulder, the lead school of business. And okay. so that initiative um, is essentially uh, getting, you know, consulting work done by these MBA students. And that runs off of a basically the two semester scale. So they usually get going, essentially they, have to uh, begin the initiative by October, but then the initiative usually runs through about April, um, just because of the school schedule. Obviously, we don't expect them to, you know, tr be trying to finish that up at the mm -hmm. same time that they're trying to, you know, accomplish their finals, because quite frankly, that wouldn't serve anyone. The students would sure you know, the, the students would be having a very hard time with it. And then the communities would not get what communities really deserve um, from one of these initiatives. So those yeah. are the two that go off of a different timeline. Everything else would be getting underway right at the beginning of August. Okay. Let me ask one more question, Danielle. Um, so I'm looking at your website and if a community wanted to take a look at um, you mentioned the application process is fairly time intensive. If they wanted to take an initial look at that to see if it's something they um, have the energy for, where would they look for that? Is it on your website yet? Absolutely. Um, no, so they are not. The, the applications will open in March, but uh, the great thing is that we use Salesforce for all of our applications. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, we have an online portal which essentially will have a link on this page here that'll take you straight to our portal. But let me just, while I have everyone here, I can, I can show everyone. So you would go to, aha, there we go. Um, so this essentially is, it's what it looks like for me because I'm a user. Um, there's a main login page that basically clicking on that link on our website would take you right to, would take you to this page. 
uh, which is where you would apply for, quite frankly, any of our programs. And essentially what you would do is you'd scroll down to Blueprint 2.0, and then all of the um, applications right now are unpublished, which is why mm -hmm. I do this. But it will have um, all of the applications on there. Mm -hmm. And you can take a look at um, any of the applications without having to submit anything, essentially. Okay. So, um, yeah. And I, I would highly recommend that. But also what's great is you can save your application as you mm -hmm. go along. So obviously, you know, like I said, one step is getting those um, letters of recommendation. Um, we don't expect you to have, you know, to be able to do everything at once is, is way too labor intensive, um, which is why we give two and a half months. And then, as I said, any of the applications can be saved as you're going through the process. So if communities want to consider an application, they should get on there March 15th, right, right when it opens to take a look at it and start conversations in their communities to see, is this a fit for us? Are we a fit for Colorado um, Blueprint? Do we want to pursue this as a community or not? Absolutely. Um, I would actually okay. recommend having conversations even prior to that. I would mm -hmm. recommend starting your conversations around when we release our next round of initiatives. If you realize that an initiative is going to be the right fit or is something that you would like to pursue as a community, I don't think that there's going to be anything on the application that is necessarily going to hinder you. Mm -hmm. um, it might just take a little more work than a community had particularly anticipated. But like I said, if it's something that speaks to you as a community, it's absolutely something that you per should pursue. Mm -hmm. And when are you going to be releasing those new initiatives again? February? Um, you're shooting for February 15th. Okay, okay. So we can take a look at, at the website again in mid-February and see what the new initiatives are. Also knowing that a lot of them are going to remain the same, like you said, so people can start really now thinking about, is this something that as a community we want to pursue partnership with? Exactly. Um, and are, would you be available, Danielle, if, if communities are serious about um, really wanting to consider this? And, and uh, would you be available for people to run questions by, bounce ideas off of? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Great. That is what I'm here for. Yeah. And okay. we, um, we will, you don't necessarily need to uh, put a save the date down. Uh, we will be doing a press release. So if I can get um, everyone's email addresses and everyone is okay with it, um, I can add you all to our essentially our, our press email list um, so that anytime we have kind of a new program um, that becomes available we can certainly send you all emails to let you know but you would also be getting that Colorado um, Blueprint 2.0 press release telling you what the new initiatives were and taking you you know, it would have instructions on how to get to our website there. You could view all of the one pagers and kind of see what has changed from last year to this year. Okay, uh, great. Start to get an idea of what it could do for your community and begin talking, or at least, you know, having those conversations in your community about whether or not it's something that you should pursue. Fantastic. I wanted to read a comment. Um, thank you, Danielle. Danielle, this information is so helpful, and I'm really excited to learn of your interest in rural Colorado. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, we will, um, like I said, I will follow up by email um, with everybody who registered for this webinar. Um, and Danielle, I noticed you shared your email, so I'm assuming it will be okay for me to share your email with everybody who registered. Of course. Uh, and then um, if anyone wants to be on that mailing list, I'll just leave it to you to contact Danielle directly and ask to be added to that mailing list so you can get the current updates for when everything comes out. Um, you can be the first to know. Um, well, unless there's anything else, this has been really informative. Thank you. So I think we'll go ahead and close. And thank you so very much for your time and everything you're doing for our communities. Of course, absolutely. I'm really excited to share all of this with you, and I really hope to see some applications from these communities because this is really, this is what Colorado Blueprint is about, is helping rural communities realize the kind of future that they want to have. So I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to share. Fantastic. Awesome. And I'll just say as we close, for those of you who are still on, um, we hope to see you tomorrow at 1.30 for our webinar with Chris Markison, the Director of Economic Development for Pueblo County. Um, okay. Thank you, Danielle. And um, thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye.